Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining me today. Let me pray for our time together as we get started. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to dig into your word together. I pray that you would help us to be open to all that you want to say to us and help me to be attentive to your Holy Spirit. May you speak through me all that you want to say and may you receive all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So something you may not know about me is that I'm a bit of a superhero nerd. I enjoy watching all the Marvel superhero movies. I watch some of the superhero television shows that are available right now. Um, I grew up reading the comic books. I still, even to this day, occasionally enjoy a good comic book. Um, for, for our opening question today, I wanted to ask, um, who is your favorite superhero? For me, uh, there are a lot of superheroes that I like, but ever since I was a kid, my two favorite superheroes uh, have been Spider-Man from Marvel and The Flash from DC. Now, it's not so much because of their particular superpowers, but more because I just like the characters themselves. Now, I open with that because in the passage we're going to look at today, uh, we see an event that must have looked like something that comes out of a superhero comic book or movie. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. Today we continue our sermon series on the life of Peter with a look at one of the most famous moments from Peter's life, walking on water. Now, if you know me, you know that this is a very dear story to me. I have found the story to be impactful in my own life. I have preached and taught on it many times. I even have a, a, a picture about this event hanging that usually hangs on, on the wall in my office at Crown College. However, I have it right here in the background uh, for this sermon. Uh, it was a gift that was given to me uh, by someone from my previous church. A shout out to Scott and Rhonda Davidson. Uh, they gave this to me as a gift for my ordination. And uh, they chose this picture because of a message that I preached on this passage back when they first started attending the church. I've actually preached on this many times over the years. Maybe you have even heard me preach on this passage before. Typically, I like to combine this story with the story that goes before it about the feeding of the 5,000 and treat those two passages together and kind of even talk a, a little bit about what happens in between. Uh, because I love the contrast between Peter walking on water and the the guys who were in the boat compared to those who were still left on the shore after the feeding of the 5,000. Um, but that's not where I'm going to go today. Because we're doing this as part of our sermon series on the life of Peter, I'm going to simply focus on this walking on water passage itself rather than tying the two stories together. With that in mind, though, it is still good for the purpose of context for us to recognize that this comes on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000 passage which explains what is happening at the beginning of this. So let's pick things up in Matthew 14 with verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Okay, so I mentioned that right after, this is, this is happening right after the feeding of the 5,000. So there was this huge crowd who had just experienced this amazing miracle with Jesus. And we then see three things happening um, in the first couple of verses. First of all, Jesus sends away the disciples in a boat. Then he dismisses the crowds. And then he goes up on a mountain alone to pray. Let's talk about those three, three things for just a moment. First of all, Matthew says that Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side, which is talking about the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Notice that it says that Jesus made them get in the boat. The word itself there means to compel or to force, like he demanded this from them. What do you think of that? So remember, Jesus is their master. Their role is to do what he says. And the fact that Jesus made them get into the boat and go before him to the other side suggests that he had a purpose in doing so. And we get a few glimpses of that along the way, and we'll see that as we talk about the sermon. After dismissing the disciples, Jesus dismissed the crowds. What do you think that means? So at the end of our worship time, uh, Jake, our worship leader, dismisses the congregation. That could be the kind of dismissal that we see here, but the way this is worded 
by sending the disciples off while he stayed behind to dismiss the crowd suggests that it would take some time, or else he could have just told the crowd to go home and then told the disciples to get in the boat. During the last song at the river, however, if you've noticed, if you've been there, I tend to get up and I go back and stand in the foyer, or if it's nice, I go outside. I do that for the purpose of dismissing the crowds. I say goodbye to people as they leave. Actually, Julie and I are typically there for about an hour and a half or more dismissing the crowds. Some of our best ministry happens during that time. I, I pray with people who, who um, come with a prayer request. Sometimes some people s come seeking counsel or advice. Some want to share good news about their lives or talk about what God is doing or what he is revealing to them in their devotions. Sometimes it's about to about a, a point in the sermon that they want to talk or some other theological question they are wrestling with. Sometimes they just want to talk. I believe that Jesus is talking more about that kind of dismissing the crowds. He probably ministered to them, cared for them individually as they drifted away. Actually, in John's gospel, he includes some extra information that the people wanted to force him to become their king at this moment, and he didn't want that to happen. So he might have also been diffusing that situation as well during that time. The third thing that happens here is, is that Jesus went off by himself up on a mountain to pray. What do you think of that? So I love these moments in Jesus' life. He often went off to solitary places to pray. I don't know if he was introverted or not, but he definitely valued his alone time. Actually, it's not really alone time. Uh, he was very intentional in those moments about going off to reconnect with his father to recharge emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and directionally. Actually, if we look back to the start of this chapter, before the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus had just found out that John the Baptist had been killed, and he was trying to get away for some alone time when he saw the crowds and put off his needs to stop and have compassion on them. I think there are many reasons why Jesus sent off the disciples and stayed behind, but I think at least one of those reasons was so that he could have this time to be alone with his father before rejoining them. Now, while he dismissed the crowds and got off for this alone time, what was happening on the boat? So verse 24 suggests that they were struggling a bit. The disciples were far away from shore, most likely several miles across the sea, kind of in the middle. But the wind was against them and the waves were battering them while they were trying to row to shore. It suggests a storm. So storms were known to come uh, up quickly in that area. There were high mountains to the east and the wind would um, surge through the mountains and swoop down upon the water where it would cause waves to sometimes get as high as eight or nine feet. And the disciples were out there in the middle of the sea getting battered by the storm. With that picture in mind, let's pick things up in verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Let me just point out that the reference to the fourth watch is because the Romans would divide uh, the, the night time from sunset to sunrise into four watches. The fourth one being from 3, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So this was happening sometime in those early morning hours before sunrise. Now let me ask this, how do you picture this moment? As you may know, I have a bit of an art background and I think visually and have a pretty good imagination. But I find this particular event very difficult to imagine. I can kind of picture Jesus walking on like a completely calm sea, almost like the water would just become solid wherever he placed his foot. But the minute you add the storm to the story, I don't know how to picture it anymore. The artist for the image behind me did a good job, but because it's a picture, it's frozen in time. It's when movement is included that my image begins to really break down. You know, I was once out on the ocean, far from land, in a fishing boat, and it wasn't even stormy. It was just a windy day and the water was was like this choppy, chaotic mess of waves with the boat rocking all over the place. I can't imagine what someone walking on that kind of water would have even looked like. I mean, did he kind of like hover over the tops of the water? Kind of like flying, like, like Superman kind of coming out across the waves? Or did the waves part for him so that it was a little more uniform where he walked? 
Or was he partially submerged with the waves hitting him at different levels? And did the waves freeze in suspended animation while he walked? Did he walk up one side and then down the other? I have no idea how to picture this in my head. Maybe you're doing a better job of it. I also want to point out that there are miracles inside of this miracle. Think about this. Jesus was traveling from about three miles or so away across the stormy sea in the middle of the night. The disciples had left many hours before, and yet they had gotten caught in the storm. And yet Jesus catches up to them, uh, walking on the water. That suggests not just the supernatural ability of being able to walk on the water, but also super speed as well. But even more amazing to me is that he went right to them in the middle of the sea. Do you know what the likelihood would have been from a point three miles away in the middle of the night on a stormy sea with no GPS, no radar, no satellite help, and yet wind up finding this small boat? It would have been miraculous even if Jesus was on a Coast Guard cutter. But he was walking on the water and walked right to them. I also think it's important to go beyond just picturing Jesus walking on the water and think about this from the perspective of Peter and the rest of the disciples in the boat. So how might the disciples' response in these verses help us form our picture? It says that they were freaking out, right? They were crying out in fear. They were terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. This suggests to me that it must have looked kind of creepy, like something out of a horror movie. Remember, it was the middle of the night, and it was stormy. Visibility was probably very limited, and so when they saw him, they were probably not so sure what they were seeing. Not to mention the fact that, that nothing human can walk on the water, so even if visibility was fine, it would have been hard for them to process. But when we add in the idea of decreased visibility, it became terrifying for them. I don't know if it was lightning that would occasionally light up Jesus, or if the moonlight was filtering through the, crowd, through the clouds. Um, but whatever it looked like, it, it had these grown men who were accustomed to li life on the sea freaking out. And it's not until Jesus calls out to them not to fear that they finally realize it's okay. Actually, where it's translated, it is I. The actual words are, I am. That's significant because this is how God identified himself to Moses in the book of Exodus. I am. Jesus makes several I am statements of himself. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here he says, I am. Do not be afraid. That statement has a powerful effect on Peter. He too was scared of the wind and the waves. He too was freaking out when he saw what he thought was a ghost. But when he heard Jesus say, I am, do not be afraid, it caused him to have a very interesting response. Look at his response beginning in verse 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to, to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Notice that Peter says, If it is you. Most likely, this is more like he is saying, Since it is you. Not really asking if it's him. But notice that Peter then asked Jesus to command him to come out, of, out onto the water. What do you think of that request? What do you think Peter was expecting? And why ask Jesus to command him? Why not just jump out and run to him? It's an interesting question, right? I don't know exactly what Peter was expecting, but it's interesting the way he asks Jesus to command him rather than just impetuously jumping out of the boat. I think it shows that he recognizes the impossibility of what he is asking. I also see a tie-in to the way that back, remember at the, back at the beginning when Jesus commanded them to get into the boat in the first place. And here, Peter is seeking the same kind of a command to get out of the boat and walk on water. Because while Peter can't walk on the water, he knows that if Jesus invites him to do it, he could. And Jesus does invite Peter to come to him. And Peter gets out of the boat and goes to Jesus. The way this is worded suggests that Peter, at least for a moment, 
and was able to walk on the water himself. What do you think of that? I love the idea of this image. It's one thing to, to think of Jesus walking on the water, but Peter walking on the water is something else entirely. I imagine him kind of like a wobbly child testing his footing. But he got out and walked on the water. I can't even imagine what it must have felt like to defy the laws of nature like that. Going back to our opening illustration, Peter was doing something that humans are incapable of doing. For that moment, it was like he was a superhero. It must have been amazing. But while the feeling of walking on water must have been incredible, even more importantly, Peter was experiencing something special in his faith journey. Consider the kind of faith it took to do this. Notice that it's not until verse 32 that the wind ceased. So that implies that it was still this chaotic, choppy waves and wind that we see before. I ca cannot imagine getting out of the boat at that moment. It would, have been, it would have taken faith to try and walk on water, even in the best of circumstances, even if they were in a shallow pond somewhere. But in the midst of a storm, it would have required even more faith. Peter could have stayed in the relative comfort and safety of the boat, but he took a faithful risk to get out of the boat and to go to Jesus. And at least for a moment, he walked on water an experience he would have missed if he had stayed in the comfort of the boat. I think that's a good lesson. As long as we only stay within our comfort level, we will never experience anything like this. And understand, Peter was already on a journey full of risk. He, he, he had laid down his life to follow Christ. It's not like he had been playing it safe before this moment. But this faith-filled risk led to an experience with Christ that must have been unbelievable. However, it wasn't completely perfect. Notice that he starts to sink. What was the difference between when he was able to walk on the water and when he started to sink? So the difference was that he took his eyes off of Jesus and started looking at the storm, right? After Jesus rescued him, he said, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? Isn't that interesting? I mean, Peter was the only one who had faith to get out of the boat in the first place. But while his faith was strong enough to get out of the boat in the face of the storm, his faith wavered. The word for doubt there in verse 31 suggests indecision, uncertainty. His faith wavered between trusting in Christ and being scared of the storm and the impossibility of what he was doing. There's so much in this passage. I feel like we could take this sermon in a whole bunch of different directions. We could talk about so much that it's almost overwhelming. There is lesson upon lesson that we could learn from this story. So before we close, let me ask you, what is the most impactful lesson you learned from this story? What do you see here that you get about your own faith journey? So my closing thoughts are this. I want to bring us back to those brief moments when Peter actually walked on water. We need to remember that Peter was not a superhero. He did something for a moment that defied the laws of nature, but it wasn't because he had superpowers. It was because in faith, he got out of the comfort and relative safety of the boat and walked to Christ. And he got to experience something amazing, at least for a brief moment, until he took his eyes off of Christ. And then he sank. Why? Because Peter wasn't superhuman. He couldn't walk on water. He could only do what he was doing because of Christ. It takes faith for us to get out of our comfort zone and risk a metaphorical walk on the water. But when we do, we need to remember to keep our eyes on Christ. Our tendency is to look at the storms around us and to realize how impossible everything is. We're not superhuman. We don't have superpowers. The only way for us to do impossible things is to fix our eyes on Christ. And actually, that's true with every moment of our lives, not just when we're walking on water. And if we become as focused on Christ as we're supposed to be, then we might find ourselves walking on water without even realizing it, doing things we never could have done on our own. I want to end with this. I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon this picture that, that Scott and Rhonda Davidson gave to me almost 20 years ago for my ordination. As I mentioned earlier, they chose this picture because one of my early sermons at the church was on this passage. I also keep the note that they gave with this picture taped to the back of it. 
Let me read just a little bit of what they wrote. When you first came, you encouraged us to hear Jesus' command and get out of the boat. But the real inspiration and joy for us has been witnessing and sharing your own water walk. I want to close by saying that I don't know what your journey with Christ is going to include. I don't know what impossible things he is going to call you to do or what storms you are going to encounter along the way. But I encourage you to have faith. To fix your eyes on Jesus and follow him, no matter what the risks, embrace the water walk that he has for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm not sure exactly who's listening to this message, but I pray for their journey. Wherever you're going to take them, whatever you want them to do, may they fix their eyes upon you and walk in in a way that ignores the risks and ignores the storms and simply follows you. I pray for that for myself as well. Lord, it can be easy sometimes to focus upon the impossibility of what life brings us. Help us to walk. Help us to follow you. Help us to keep our eyes on you where they belong. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.